Hello everyone and welcome to this online GCSE PE tutorial which today is going to be focusing on the principles of training. Principles of training are the golden rules that we apply when planning an effective exercise or training program. Now over the course of this tutorial we want to be looking at a number of things and firstly we're going to identify what the principles actually are. We're then going to try and explain what each of the training principles is and how this links to improving fitness. And then lastly, we're going to apply the training principles to what is called a personal exercise program. So, the principles of training, the golden rules that should be considered when an athlete is following an effective and worthwhile personal exercise program. On the note of a PEP or personal exercise program, this is a training plan aimed at improving a specific component of fitness. So when we're putting this training plan together, we need to ask ourselves a series of questions to ensure the training plan or the PEP is effective. And by applying these principles, we will hopefully answer all of those questions. Now, the principles of training can be remembered using the term first stop. Each of those letters represents one of the principles. As you can see on the left hand side of your screen now, the principles are being listed. So first stop is the way in which we remember every single one of those principles of training that should be applied to a personal exercise program. And now we're going to delve into a little bit more detail with each one. So starting with specificity, this is matching your PEP to the requirements of the activity you are training for or the requirements of the sport you are training for. So is the training appropriate for your sport? Does it replicate the type of fitness or the type of movements used in a game? Are you training the correct muscles? And are you training the correct energy system, i.e. aerobic or anaerobic? So for example, if we were uh, training for a rowing competition or a rowing event, then using a static rowing machine would be a specific type of training that matches that sport. On the flip side, if you were a sprint athlete, you probably wouldn't take part in a huge amount of endurance training. You would mostly be focusing on explosive interval training. So see if you can have a little go at this task. On the top row, we have three different methods of training. And underneath that, we have three different sports events. Pause the video, see if you can match the correct method to the correct sport. Right, so let's see how you did. So we had plyometrics, resistance training and spinning. So plyometrics, with it being explosive bounding exercises, would have linked to high jump more specifically. Resistance training in the upper body would have linked to shot put. And hopefully you all got spinning would link to cycling. So there you go, you can see a clear example of specificity being applied to sport. The next one is individual needs. So this means that you match your training program to the person themselves and their individual requirements. So is the training developing the component fitness the athlete actually requires? Does the training relate to the athlete's age, gender and level that they play at? Does the training match the fitness level of the athlete? Now, it's really important to note that there is a clear difference between individual needs and specificity. Individual needs relates to the person. Specificity is the sport. So if you look at the two images that we have on the screen at the moment, both of these individuals are football players. However, they, are, they require very different training based on the component that they require their age, the level that they're playing at, and the fact that they'll have very different fitness levels. So although they might be playing the same sport, they may even be in the same team, individual needs will be very much different. And that can also relate to the position that they play to. Now, progressive overload is gradually increasing your training over a period of time so that the body is pushed and encouraged to make positive adaptations. Those positive adaptations might be fitness-based, as in cardiovascular endurance, strength, power, speed, agility. Anything that allows your body or pushes your body to make positive changes that are going to improve your overall fitness. Now, this can be done by applying the FIT rule. 
F I double T. The first thing relates to the frequency. So you increase the number of times the athlete trains over the course of that training program. You can increase the intensity, so how hard the athlete trains. You can increase the time, so how long the athlete trains for. And you can also develop the type of training so that it's suitable for progress. Now it's really important that progressive overload is managed very carefully to avoid injury. If you overload the athlete too quickly, then injury can occur. If we apply progressive overload to a resistance program, in week one, the athlete here training once a week, spending 30 minutes in the gym, 10 kilogram weights, only focusing on bicep curls, doing five repetitions and two sets of that. The following week, he might pick that up, training twice a week, extending the time, extending the weight, varying the type of exercise he's doing. And then by week three, he's absolutely shredded. He's training three times a week, 60 minutes each time, 20 kilo weights, varying the exercise again. And he's obviously increased his reps and his sets. So again, you might be worthwhile pausing the video and just having a look at the frequency, intensity, time and type and how it's applied here. The next thing is overtraining. So this relates to training too much or lacking sufficient rest periods each week, which can lead to injury and prevent improvements from happening. Overtraining can often occur when adequate rest has not been built into the training program. So there's no rest days built in each week. The fit principle has not been applied properly. So if sessions are too long, they're too often each week, they're too intense, they're too difficult. And one of the biggest reasons for overtraining is that there's too much pressure being placed on the athlete, either from the cells or from coaches, to make improvements in a short time scale. Very, very important to understand that the body will only make positive adaptations such as muscle growth if given the time to rest. All those changes happen when the body is resting and recuperating. Now this is an example of overtraining right here. We would have a seven day overview of two different athletes, both of who play in the same team, but both doing very different weekly regimes. Now, as you can see on a Monday, they both take a weights program. Tuesday, they're both training with their team. But on Wednesday, athlete B has a rest and recovery day where athlete A is back in the gym. Thursday, they're training again. Friday is a very light team run through. But after the team run through, athlete A decides to go in the gym and do more weights. Saturday is match day, so quite an intense day. And then Sunday, athlete B has a rest and recovery, whereas athlete A is back in the gym. That means that athlete A is eventually going to burn out. And we're not going to see those positive changes happen. Whereas athlete B, because of that rest and recovery, they can continue working at a much higher level. So it's really important that in your training program, adequate rest and recovery is built in to prevent overtraining from happening. Now reversibility links very nicely to overtraining because reversibility relates to any improvements that have been made are subsequently lost through a lack or stopping training. Now this doesn't mean that when you are on your rest days reversibility occurs. This means that when you stop through a significant amount of time. Now this might be due to injury where you have to stop training. It might be in the off season, so the period of time between your last season ending and your new season beginning. And equally, it could also be due to other commitments that take over your sport or training. So it might be family, it could be work, it could even be school. So it's important to understand that this principle you are looking to avoid. So when planning your training program, by thinking about overtraining and reversibility as one, you can ensure that both of these things don't happen. The last principle of training that you need to be aware of is thresholds of training. And this links to aerobic and anaerobic energy systems. And making sure that your training program is pitched at the correct intensity so that you are working within the correct zone. So for example, if we look at heart rates here on the left hand side, if we have light training, which means your heart rate is at 60 to 70% of its maximum, all the way up to the maximum heart rate of 100%, we can look at which threshold you should be training in. So the aerobic threshold means that your heart rate is between 60 and 80% of its maximum. 
Anaerobic is anything above 80% of your maximum heart rate. Therefore, depending on what you are trying to train for, you will train in one of these two zones. So if you're trying to improve your endurance or you're trying to lose body fat, then you would do some form of aerobic training because that develops your cardiovascular endurance and muscular endurance. So something maybe like continuous training. Whereas if you were trying to develop something anaerobically, such as your speed, power, strength, then you would work in your anaerobic threshold where you're trying to get your heart rate above 80%. Now the way to work out what threshold you are working in is by using something called the Carvonen formula. Now the Carvonen formula starts by working out your maximum heart rate, which based on the simple equation is 220 minus your age. To work out your anaerobic threshold, we then put 80, because 80% is where we need to be above, times your maximum heart rate, and then divide that by 100. And similarly, to work out the aerobic threshold, you include 60 times your maximum heart rate, divide by 100. So just to give you a couple of examples here, athlete at A, 15 years of age, their maximum heart rate is 205 beats per minute. Therefore, to work anaerobically, they need to make sure their heart rate is above 164. To work aerobically, they need to make sure their heart rate is above 123, but ensuring it doesn't go beyond 164 because then they will switch to their anaerobic threshold. Athlete B is a little bit older. Athlete B is 25 years of age, so therefore their maximum heart rate is 195. And as you can see here, their anaerobic and aerobic thresholds are different to athlete A. So we need to make sure that when you are planning your training program, you are doing so so that you are sitting in the correct threshold. So now we've been through each of the principles. Let's see if you can actually do this little task on your own at home. And can you plan your own personal exercise program by applying the principles? So see if you can complete this table, choose the sport that you play, potentially the position, because that might have some bearing effect on your training, and try and select a component of fitness that you want to improve on. And then try and apply specificity. How will the training program match your sport? The individual needs, how does it match you as a person? How are you going to progressively overload you through the pro program by using the FIT principles? What threshold are you aiming to be within? And can you work out the Kavonen formula to determine where you should be sitting in relation to your beats per minute? And how are you going to uh, prevent overtraining and reversibility from occurring? So hopefully now, by the end of this tutorial, you can do a number of things. You can identify what each of those first stop means when it comes to principles. You can explain what each principle is and why they're important in a pair. And the most important thing is that you can actually apply each of the principles to a training program or a personal exercise program aimed at improving one of your identified weaknesses. Give that a go. Skip back a few slides if you need to review again and make sure that you are solid and can answer each of those three questions. If you can, then fantastic, you've nailed principles of training.